friends and family. Um, so I want, I'm going to start my sermon today, and I was planning to give a brief State of the Union address about how we're doing as a church. We do this once a year, and I'm going to preach a full sermon today as well. Um, but before I share what I was planning to share regarding the State of the Union, I want to speak from my heart a little bit. And I pray you hear what I'm about to say because of what happened on Tuesday in Oxford. Um, as a parent, you know, my heart <laughs> goes out to those parents, to those students, to the community. And every Wednesday, and we would love to invite you this Wednesday at 5.45 p.m. We prayed last Wednesday, prayed a lot for Oxford, pray, prayed a lot over everything going on there. Love to invite you again this Wednesday at 5.45 to join us. But as I was reflecting, as I was praying, I felt like the Holy Spirit laid in my heart a few things that I felt compelled to share. And again, I just pray you hear my heart in these things. But when, when, when an unspeakable tragedy happens like it did, I, I was reminded, I felt like just God laid in my heart, first and foremost, that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world, full stop. Like Jesus is the only hope. I was also reminded that before the second coming, right, there's a battle we're in, the devil's real, but he's not going to win the war. And we need to just believe that. I'm also reminded that we need to pour into our families like never before, that we need to love our loved ones well. That begins in our homes. I, I, I am reminded that we need to pray like never before and believe in the power of prayer like never before. I'm reminded that we need to press into our identity in Christ. And we need to tell others about their identity in Christ, about who God says they are and how God already sees them and how he wants them to see themselves. Because if that boy understood who, how God sees him, if that boy understood, he would have never done what he did. Just as simple as that. And I'm reminded as well that local churches like ours, local churches like those in Oxford gathering today, local churches are the hope for each community. Local churches like ours, those in Oxford, are the hope for each state, for our country, and for the world. So it really matters that we gather together. It really does. And so as, as I begin my State of the Union, I wanted to share that. And again, once again, I, I pray you hear my heart with those words. And, and as I transition to talk about the State of the Union and the finances, I pray this doesn't feel like a shift without a clutch here. But, but the truth is, in order for every local church to be the hope in the community they're in, they have to have financial health. They just do. And so what I'm going to talk about really matters. It, 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 just, it just does. I believe this more than ever in our 11th year now. And so a couple weeks ago, we, we printed off a handout that is still available at the info table. Um, it's just four pages, very readable intentionally, thanks to Tom Petz for helping pen this. So if you haven't picked up a copy of this yet, please read it because it matters. If, you, if this is your church home, please pick up this at, at the info table on your way out. And I wanted to do a rewind about 2021 because there's a lot of highlights, a lot of things to celebrate, a lot of things to remember. And here's a slide, a quick slide that's going to show you. And actually, could, could you guys raise the lights up just a little bit again? Um, they're like extra bright today or something. So I'm like, ah. Um, if, if, I, if I had to sum up the year 2021 with just one phrase, and this is true, I, the, the phrase I feel like God laid in my heart a few months ago as I thought about this year and where we're headed in 2022, it's the phrase, hope is rising. Hope is rising. Even with what happened in Oxford this week, even with all the curveballs that COVID's thrown our way, that 2021 as a year has thrown our way across our state and throughout the world, hope is rising. Our, the, our church has not just survived this, but it has thrived. And here's just, again, some highlights. We hired a couple of new staff, um, J uh, Jenny Mason as our executive assistant, and then Shad Street, who is our director of worship. And we're excited because Shad's, Shad's mom, Sharon, is here today. So could you give us a wave, Sharon? That's very cool that you're here. So thank you for coming. You have a great son. I told you that in the lobby, but I want to declare that publicly. So it's good to see you. And even though Shad's only been here for, man, a couple of months, you've already made a, a huge impact and just, it's, come on. In addition, we launched, uh, again, School Kingdom Ministry on Wednesday nights here in the sanctuary. And we have this amazing class, bigger than the one we offered two years ago. And it's all about equipping people in their faith, equipping people to live out their identity in Christ. This past August, and by the way, 
feel free, if you feel the Holy Spirit nudge, to applaud any of these. Just, I'm just planting a little seed there. We have coffee, so we need to wake up a little bit, church. Come on. So here, I'm just kind of priming the pump, lobbing a softball here. This past August, we had our annual baptism event at Stony Creek Metro Park, and we baptized 10 people. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for leading the charge. Come on, seriously. Seven of them are part of our church family. Three others are friends of the church. That's pretty awesome. When it came to community outreach this year, we had an Easter egg hunt. Thanks to Jess Gortat for leaning up on the, on the one acre of grass that we co-own with the property right on, on the other side of us wall. It's pretty cool. And here's the thing. For like a day in, in April, kids were able to be kids and have fun. And that matters. It really does. We also had our thankful fest. I'll talk more about that a bit in phase two, in the phase two portion of our building, which I'm pointing to. This is a temporary wall from front to back. I'll talk more about that in a bit. And something else about 2021. We have continued to lean into generosity in the midst of all the economic uncertainty. And we've continued to give away 10% of our budget. And we, we call that a tithe in our tithe. It's about helping those who need help. And we've done that in our church family, people in this room, across our community, and even beyond. And this is incredible. Again, a church our size and scope with, with a budget our size. So far in 2021, we have given away just shy of $50,000, right? We have, it's, it's incredible. We, 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 have, we have a compassion task force that oversees everything. We have helped pay bills for members in our church family who have hit hard times in our immediate and our extended church family. We have helped offset funeral expenses for a member of our church family who lost a loved one this year. That money has included partnering with the Friends of Foster Kids, helping local foster kids in the foster care system across the Tri-County area. FaithWorks as an organization helping fund repair projects for widows and others. We've been partnering more and more with an international church plan effort that you'll hear more about called Bamboo. And again, all that's made possible in $50,000 of outward focus, helping those who need help. It's because of what you give. You make that possible. And so I pray that just puts wind in your sails. So you need to know when you give. Obviously, it helps our church. It helps make our church exist, but it does so much more. And so again, those are some highlights of what we've done over the past year, and I'm thankful but now I want to look over the horizon, and I want to invite you to truly dream with me, to pray with me, and to dream with God. This past September, Time is Flying has marked the third anniversary of us being in the building. We were a portable church for seven years, and we have been now in this building for three years as of Labor Day weekend this past year, which thank you, Jesus, that we... <laughs> So what, what's cool, amazing God story I, I've shared before. When we bought this building three years ago, it's over 27,000 square feet. It's an old farmer jack, for those of you who are old school Shelby Township people. And, and we knew at the time when we bought the building, we only needed about 12,000 square feet from front to back. And so we built out what we're calling phase one. You are in phase one of the building. Even if you don't realize it, this is phase one from front to back that includes sanctuary, lobby, teens room, the kids' classrooms, prayer room, social hall, all that. So there's another 15,000 square feet on the other side of that wall from front to back of that building. So we're super blessed as a church, this God story, that we're, we are going to be able to double the size of everything we do at the church without having to move. We just have to knock down a wall, which is pretty cool. Like that is, that's a blessing. And again, just the God story about how God brought us here. And, and we know, we know that God's ultimate dream for the phase two portion of the building isn't to leave it like a warehouse farmer jack from 1999 look. We know that. We know that. And so we, we are inviting you to dream with us, to dream with God about how that space, what it's going to be become, how God already sees it, and how God's going to use that space to bless the region, to bless our community. And so in, in, in the year 2022, we are feeling, this is the language we're using, taking our first steps into the phase two portion of our building, our first steps into it. So that goes back a couple weeks ago to Thankful Fest. We had, for those of you who went to Thankful Fest, a 55-foot bounce house obstacle course that, yes, I went on, and I kind of injured myself going down the slide. It was pretty fun. But I'm okay now. Um, and 
for many of you, I know that was your first time ever in the phase two portion of the building, first time ever. For others of you, it's been maybe a couple of years since you've been over there. And so again, we are feeling, feeling the nudge in the year 2022 to go to take our first steps into phase two. Here's what I mean by that. For the past 10 years, our advisory board, and this has just been amazing, our advisory board has said that the month of December is like a 13th month of the calendar year when it comes to generosity of people giving. Spirit of generosity just happens. Typically, the month of December is a double month or a triple month, meaning that we oftentimes receive two to three times whatever we normally receive any other month happens in December. Now, that being said, we know, again, this is the time of year where your mailbox, your old school mailbox, your email inbox is flooded with requests from charities and organizations about giving a special one time a year in gift. And so we want to invite you, just as people of our church family, to pray into what that might mean for your giving to the mission. And so here's a, a slide. We're prayerfully asking everyone to consider giving a special one time year end gift above and beyond whatever your normal ties and offerings are between now and December 31st to help us take our first steps into phase two. And so that's our prayer. And the question of, well, how will the money be used? Um, we always, we strive to be the best stewards possible of everything that's given. We have an executive team, an advisory board, a finance team, and especially when it comes to large purchases. And so we have a slide that's also on the back of your handout. There's much more detail on the back of the vine I would love to invite you to read that, maybe even pull it out right now as I'm talking. But here is a prayed into prioritized list of the things, again, we intend to purchase. And, I, and I'm going to break this down very quickly, and then I have a full sermon to preach. Our first steps actually taking, our, our first steps into phase two actually begin here in the sanctuary, where the projector above me, that guy there that's projecting right now, it's actually from our portable church days. It is Beyond end of life, it's over 10 years old. It served us really well, but we really need to get a new one, and we want to buy one with the lumen count and all that that will be right-sized for the phase two version of the sanctuary. So we need a new projector. So that's the first priority. And then in addition, there are these speakers here. God bless them, and I mean this in Jesus' name. These are our portable church speakers. They got a lot of wear and tear, a lot of miles on them. We bought some good ones, but they're beyond end of life. And so we, we, we need to replace them and put them in a new configuration that will, that will like balance out the sound in the sanctuary from front to back and side to side. Many times probably why there's no one sitting in like row two. You can get blasted in row two. I bless you guys in row two. Amber Lee, right? Katie, right? You know, just, right? Um, and then it's not that loud at all in the back just so a new sound system because, you know, it's our portable stuff. Um, so thank you for giving. And also, it, it would bless me if people like sat, by the way, in the first three rows too. Like this is like the angel's corner or something. I don't know. But please feel free. Thank you, Beth, for sitting there. You are representing the church. By the way, also, and this is just kind of fun. I'm going to turn around. I'm not sure if, if you can do this, but part, part of this, my, my headset, you see this? That's actually duct tape. You see duct tape? It's actually black duct tape. This thing. Like it just kind of falling off and, and, and you see me playing with it all the time. So that's all part of it too. But also, so again, first steps in, into phase two is taking care of some stuff that we really need to for phase one. And that's fun stuff. Then when it comes to actually taking steps into phase two itself, he heat and coin is step one. Before we do anything in phase two, we know we need a furnace, a new furnace, because the current one is over 40 years old. I call it the dinosaur. I pray for the dinosaur a lot. It's in the back of the building. If you've ever been back there and hear it turn on, you are, it wakes you up. It screams with passion every single time it turns on. And it's super inefficient and loud. And it gets phase two up to 50 balmy degrees, 50 degrees. And so we know before we use phase two beyond bounce house every once in a while, we need a, a new furnace HVAC system. And on the back of of the year on giving, you can see there's asterisks for uh, the priorities three, four, five, and six. We're actively getting quotes. Brad Stahl actually this week had an HVAC company out here to get a quote. Thank you, Mike Bridges, again for the connections you're helping just make. And like we have, we're starting to form a team here to get quotes and to figure out how to get HVAC into phase two. And so again, that's part of giving to year on giving. And I have some really exciting news to share, which is just. This is just so God. So an anonymous donor who's part of our church family 
heard about our dreams, heard about our plans for phase two and how much we want to use phase two to truly bless the community, to bless, we have like regional plans. We want to bless the region in real tangible ways. And we love to partner with other organizations, other ministries. This is God's building, not our building. So other groups that want to advance the kingdom of God, we'd love to share space with them too. And I've, from like day one, even prior to us buying the building, we have said over and over again that, that we want people, like I would love every single person to come to the mission, to come here. But even if people don't in our local community, my passion is that people who might not ever walk through our doors ever would be incredibly thankful that we are here at the corner of 24 and Shelby because of all the good we do for the community. That's just the hope and a passion for me. All right? And that's, that's just, that's from day, before day one. And so what's cool, what's amazing, what's so God is this anonymous donor heard about that and say, like, we want to fast forward that timeline. We want to make that happen. And so they're offering a $50,000 matching gift challenge, right? And what that means is that if you give to, you're on giving, it doubles. Like, what you give is doubled. Double the impact, which is pretty cool. And so the way to do it, and what's really cool is they have a passion about the HVAC system which is not the funnest thing to do, but what's needed. So we get to fund the fun stuff, which is pretty cool. And so again, a way to give is simply to write year in giving on your check or in through a CCB online giving. There's an option to give a year end and it automatically gets matched. And so again, that's our State of the Union. Please pray about that. Please take this, maybe put it in your Bible and truly pray over as... As, as God leads you. And so that's my State of the Union. And now I want to preach. Um, there's a phrase out in the world, December to remember. And this is truly going to be a December to remember for me personally, because tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm going to be on an airplane flying to Brazil, which is pretty cool. Eight days going on a missions trip. Yeah, from December 6th to December the 14th. So um, I please ask for prayers Pray for on-time flights, pray against any cancellations, pray, there's three different planes to get down there, three different planes to come back, so please pray for that. Please pray that all the PCR tests, I had one yesterday, you know, pray that everything comes back negative, no false positives, all that, on both sides of the trip. Please, please pray honestly for Kelly, for the girls while I'm gone, just as the Holy Spirit leads you. And, and I just, I asked for prayers just how God led me, led Kelly to really Say you need to do this, just God's, God's in this. This would pray it would be a life changing trip, a life changing trip for me personally, for my family, for our church family, that, that it would be a game changer of just how I live my life and how I pastor here at the mission. And so I just speak that prophetically. And I'm really excited because Tony DiRenzo is going to be preaching. Where's Tony at? He's there. So Tony's preaching. He has an amazing teaching gift. If you've never heard Tony preach, thank you for using your gift, Tony. So. Please pray. Tomorrow I'll be flying out. And so today it's the second Sunday of Advent, and I just pray Holy Spirit fill me up. This season of Advent is a special season on our church calendar, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, to really prepare our hearts and minds for the birth of Jesus. And the series we're in is called All I Want for Christmas. I, I want you to think about what you want for Christmas this year, what you hope is on your Christmas list, what you hope is under the tree on Christmas morning. And, and most likely, what comes to mind are things you can get at a store. And by the way, it's great to get things for Christmas, to get stuff. But I want to reframe what Christmas could be according to the four themes of the season of Advent. The four themes of Advent are hope, peace, joy, and love. And in this series, I'm asking the question, what if those are the things that you actually got for Christmas this year, that you receive before Christmas this year, imagine if you are filled to overflowing, that if you are filled to overflowing with hope and peace and joy and love. And if you think that's impossible, think about what the Virgin Mary would say about what is impossible when it comes to God. And so since, since today is the um, December the 5th, the second Sunday of Advent, uh, all I want for Christmas is peace. Peace is the thing we're going to focus on. And you have to know that what I plan to preach today, I knew today was going to be the theme of peace. The sermon that I plan to preach a week ago today 
just began to ring incredibly hollow to my ears personally because of what happened in Oxford, what happened. And so I put that one on the shelf and I prayed asking the Holy Spirit to lead me and I really felt he led me. Because the struggle we have as believers and followers of Jesus, as people of faith, is when unspeakable things happen, when tragedies happen like they did this week on Tuesday in Oxford, when, when bad news continues to fill our airwaves, wh- what can you do? The world, the devil, wants you to be filled with fear and worry and just stop there and think there's nothing, just throw up our hands and don't think there's anything we can do. But God invites us to take a different approach, and that's the approach I'm going to preach on today. And so as you hear today's sermon, I pray you hear it through that lens. 700 years before the birth of Christ, these words were recorded in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 9. It's a prophecy. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So 700 years after that prophecy was given by Isaiah on the night Christ was born, here's what says in the Gospel of Luke in Luke 2. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. And on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So in the prophecy about Jesus' birth, he's called the Prince of Peace. And angels declare peace on earth the night of his birth. And so with those scriptures in mind, this is a very tough question. Why does the opposite of peace define how we feel every December as we look forward to the birth of the Prince of Peace? And that is a tough question. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Angels declare peace on earth at his birth. And so... The Advent season lead up to Christmas should be filled with peace, but it's often filled with the opposite. So what can we do to change that? Last Sunday I shared this scripture, which is becoming an anchor scripture of our series. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is called the God of hope in this passage. And the Apostle Paul is praying that we may not just have a spoonful of hope, but we may overflow with hope. And I shared last week how this is a supernatural thing. It's not a natural thing. It's not something that you can manufacture or drum up on your own. Because Paul says it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as I prayed about how my sermon last Sunday would tie into today's sermon, I realized something. God connected the dots for me in a pretty cool way. Where I begin to ask the question, why would the Apostle Paul want you to overflow with those things? Why would he want to fill you up with joy and peace? And I realize the answer is this. Because he wants you to give it away. He wants you to be filled with joy and peace so you can pour it out to others. Here's a key thought. God wants to fill you with joy and peace so that you pour it, so you pour it out to others. See, God wants to bless you with joy and peace because he's a good father and and good fathers give good gifts to their kids. So God wants to bless you, but he doesn't want you just to hoard those blessings like we hoarded toilet paper last year. He doesn't want you to hoard it. He blesses you so that you would bless others. He gives it to you so that you can give it away. God wants to bless you. God wants you to feel and experience peace because that's a good thing, but it shouldn't stop there. You experience the peace of God, the shalom of God for yourself so you can give it away. And and this actually gets to a key aspect of our identity in Christ, of who we are in Christ, and it's something we don't talk about enough. When it comes to this aspect of our identity, of who we are in Christ, I want to look at Luke chapter 10, 
to the events that took place 30 years after the birth of Jesus. Because there's something in this passage that's key that ties in directly with the Advent series we're in. And this passage gives us hope to believe there is something we can do when horrific things happen like they did this week in Oxford. So Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear. Luke 10, starting verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, first thing I want to point out, the main characters in this story, they're not the 12 apostles. They're the 72 others, which are nameless, faceless followers of Jesus. In other words, they're folks just like us, everyday, ordinary believers. Okay? Okay? And then Jesus gives them some instructions on what to do. Skipping down to verse 5, Jesus tells them, he says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. And then skipping down to verse 9, Jesus says this, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. A few things about this story. First of all, it talks about a quote-unquote man of peace, a person of peace. And what that means in this context is going to a town and looking for someone whose heart is open to the good news of the gospel. This person may or may not be a believer, but they are receptive to the teachings of Jesus. So that person is called by Jesus a man of peace or a person of peace. And so in today's sermon, I'm taking that story and I want to use it as a launching pad to teach that a person of peace is a bringer of peace. A person of peace is a bringer of peace. And in this passage, peace, it's not just a nice word. It's not just a kind word. It's something actually tangible. In this story, peace is something that that we can give away. Peace is something that can rest on a person. Peace is something that can rest on a location. Here's a key thought. The peace we carry is so powerful that we can speak it over our surroundings, over others, and over ourselves. And and this is a huge thought, so I'm going to take the the remainder of my sermon to break it down. And please know that if that key thought stretches your theology, allow your theology to be stretched, because I'm going to prove it to you in God's Word. Again, the peace we carry is so powerful that we can speak it over our surroundings, over others, and over ourselves. So I want to share three ways to be a person of peace during this season of Advent. Here's the first way. To be a person of peace over your surroundings. Be a person of peace over your surroundings. What I mean by that is this. Something you may not realize you have the authority to do. You can actually do something called shift the atmosphere around you. It's a key phrase, shift the atmosphere. You can be a person of peace over your surroundings by shifting the atmosphere. And to explain what I mean by that, to connect the dots, I'm going to jump out of Scripture for a moment and jump into the world. Remember the first time, again, I was, I'm 48 years old, so I'm a child of the 80s, the first time you saw the movie Jaws. Or one of its not-so-good sequels. Or maybe you didn't see Jaws. Think of some other scary movie that you saw at some point, and I'm not an advocate of scary movies. I don't watch them anymore. They don't do something good to my spirit. I just don't watch them. But for some crazy reason, Grandpa and Grandma Cop took me as like a four-year-old to see Jaws at the theater. Why? Don't know. <laughs> God bless my mom and dad. Some bad discernment there, but okay. I'm going to use Jaws as an example. Even if you never saw the movie, y'all know the theme music. Those two notes. So I want you to just imagine. Imagine yourself seated in the comfort of a movie theater. You have your popcorn. You have your Coke. You're seated in your high back chair. And you know you're staring at a screen watching a movie. You know that. And then you start to hear the music. da da Right? right? And you begin to feel afraid. 
And then the moment Jaws comes on the screen, like popcorn flies everywhere in the theater. Right? You jump out of your seat. Now think about what's going on in the theater. Think about what's happening in that theater. Here is what is happening. Hollywood has created an atmosphere of fear. And you have embraced it. Hollywood took a neutral atmosphere of a movie theater and they put images on the screen that filled the room with fear. And that fear doesn't leave us when we leave the theater. We don't leave it at the theater. We take it with us. I remember again, back when I was a kid, when I saw Jaws with my mom and dad on the big screen, the next summer I'm taking swim lessons at Fraser High School. And I just straight up, I did not want to go in the deep end because I was convinced, convinced that Jaws was like in a cage in the deep end waiting to be released to eat just me. I I seriously, I was filled with fear about going in the deep end of the pool. I had genuine fear because of Jaws. Here's a key thought. The Bible teaches that we can do the same thing that Jaws did to us, except instead of releasing fear into the atmosphere, we can release peace and blessing. You actually can do this. We can act on our surroundings. And if you're like, man, that sounds kind of crazy, Dan. Luke 10.5, Jesus said, when you enter a house, again, when you 72 nameless, faceless disciples, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. And when you read the passage, peace is not just a nice word to say. Peace is something that they carried. Peace is something that you carry. It's something tangible. And you can speak it over places and you can change the spiritual temperature of those places. And so as you go to your coffee shop this week or the grocery store, you go to school or someone's house or your Christmas party, as you walk in, whenever you enter, say this. Say this phrase, peace to this place. Or say something else along those lines. There's not anything special about that phrase. But it's important not just to think it, but to speak it out loud because there's power in words. You don't need to scream it, by the way. If you have true authority, you don't need to yell. There's power, though, when we speak. And when you say that, when you say peace to this place or something along those, along those lines, it won't just affect you. It will affect your surroundings. It will shift the atmosphere, and everyone will be impacted by it. And, and you might not ever know the impact your words have. You might not ever know, but you believe by faith that they did. You believe by faith your words had an impact because of what Jesus taught. You believe by faith that the peace you carry is so powerful, you can speak it over your surroundings. So an action step this week is to be a person of peace over your surroundings. Wherever you go, speak peace over it, just like the 72 did in Luke chapter 10. Try it. Try it this Advent season and see what happens. That's the first way, to be a person of peace. Second way is to be a person of peace over others. The peace we carry is so powerful, we can speak it over others. We can give it to others. Here's why I can say that. Because of what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, one of my favorite scriptures, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? And what was something that Jesus did? Here's what Jesus did in John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, peace I leave you. My peace, the peace of God, the shalom of God, I give you. So so if Jesus said we would do the same works he did, and if one of the things he did was give peace to people, that means we can too. And again, that's exactly what the 72 did in Luke 10. Jesus told them, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Pay attention to the language. If a man of peace is there, your peace, your peace will rest on him. That's what they did. And we can do the same thing. The peace we carry is so powerful, we can speak it over others. We can give it to others. And so it could be as simple as saying, 
peace be with you. And, and when you're saying that, what you're doing is you're speaking blessing over someone, and we could all use more blessing in our lives. I know I can. And so when you say, peace be with you, what you're doing is you're speaking the peace of God. You're speaking shalom. Shalom means, it's, it's a pregnant word. It means peace and safety and blessing and friendship and health and contentment and harmony and fulfillment and completeness and wholeness. That is the peace of God. The shalom, the peace of God is wrapped, all that's wrapped up in that word. And that's what God wants for every person on this planet in every sphere of our lives, the shalom of God. And so if someone is having a bad day, if someone is fighting with someone, if they're experiencing a storm in your life, I want you to believe that you can be a person of peace, that you can bless that person with your words, and that what you say releases something over them. And it will actually impact then what they say or think or do after you say it. And again, you may not ever know the impact your words have. You may not ever know, same as me as I preach, I have no idea how this lands. Unless you like write me an email or a letter, I, I don't know. But I speak by faith, I declare by faith, I prophesy by faith, and say, all right, Holy Spirit, now you take it and do whatever you need to do in each person's life. Same thing. So by saying, peace be with you, you might not ever know the impact those words had that you were in that moment, in that place for a reason to shift the atmosphere. And you believe by faith your words have an impact. You believe by faith that the peace that you carry is so powerful, you can speak it over others. And that's good news. And the good news gets even better because the third action step is this. Be a person of peace over yourself. Be a person of peace over yourself. Don't raise your hands, but I want to ask some questions. Have you ever been having a good day, maybe even a great day? And then in like an instant, like a flashpoint happens, and you just become incredibly angry or agitated or filled with fear. Or you experience out of the blue anxiety or exhaustion. Have you ever been having like a pretty okay day and then out of nowhere you just start to gossip or you feel depressed or impatient or apathetic or just filled with some other negative emotion that won't be in heaven? And you find yourself all of a sudden, out of the blue, out of nowhere, thinking or feeling or saying things you normally never would. And, and when something like that happens, it has a snowball effect where one thing can lead to the other. And that thought of that feeling can build and build, and it can consume you, it can derail you for the rest of the day, or even longer than a day. And, and, and when we think these things, or we say these things, or we do these things, we often think in natural terms like, man, must be low blood sugar. Should have ate an apple. Or we think maybe it's because we didn't get enough sleep last night. Or we just ran into that person that just kind of gets under our skin. Speaking hypothetically, of course, I know we don't have any of those in our lives, right? Or we just think, I'm just having one of those bad days. Case of the Mondays, you know, or whatever. But what if something is actually going on spiritually? What if something is attacking us, influencing us, oppressing us, and we don't even realize it? So we focus on a natural explanation. When there's not a natural explanation, there's a supernatural explanation. And we are a casualty of the spiritual battle we don't even know we're fighting. And so a key way to fight is when those bad things start to happen. You can be a person of peace over yourself. Here's how to do it. Here's what Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Here's the key. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so when, when, when life starts to go sideways for you, you can be a person of peace over yourself and not just let it happen. We can take those thoughts captive. We can catch ourselves when we start to lose our peace. 
So when your thoughts, your words, your actions start to go sideways, catch yourself and say something like this out loud. Say one of these words or phrases, shalom, shalom, just speak it. God help me, great prayer. Help, Lord, great prayer. Or simply the name Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And so let me encourage you to speak peace over yourself. And have faith to believe that the peace you carry is so powerful, you can do that. Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul wants the God of hope to fill you with all joy and peace and peace, and hope and love. (laughs) And the reason he wants you to be filled with those is that, first of all, that's good. God of hope is a good father, gives you good gifts. Those are good gifts to have, to feel, to experience. But don't stop there. You are filled up. God pours into you so that you can pour yourself out. So God gives to you so you can give it away. God wants to bless you so that you can bless others. God wants to bless you with peace, with the shalom of God during this season of Advent so that, yes, you can experience that peace for yourself and both and so you can give it away. And I pray as a church we do exactly that, that we would have the faith to believe, that we would dare to believe God's word is true. And what Jesus did to the 72, he can do for you, wants to do for you, gives you the authority to do it. That We would have the faith to believe that the peace we carry is so powerful, so powerful, we can speak it over our surroundings, we can speak it over others, and we can speak it over our selves. Amen. Amen. You need to believe-